So good evening, Madam Chair. Is that better? There you go. Good evening, Madam Chair and other committee members. So my name is John Hewitt. I'm the Vice President of Projects and Energy, working for Citizen Green Energy, which is located at 1580 Park 10 Place in Houston, Texas, and my personal address is in Portland, Oregon. Um, I'm here to talk about our project this evening. Um, we can give you and the committee you know, and the facts and figures of what we have uh, chosen to do is to give you some documentation that you've already received this evening. Um, and we plan on making that same information available to the public after this meeting if they hold it all close to your mouth, please. Thank um, you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Thank you. So, so what I would like to do, um, in principle, rather than get into lots of facts and figures, is just tell you why we're here um, in Aurora. There's a very strong legacy for ammonia production in Nebraska, dating back to the 1950s. It's a uh, fertilizer, liquid fertilizer product that's very familiar to uh, all of the farming community here. Um, over a million tons of ammonia is imported annually, and there's occasions when there are deficits and price hikes, etc. So by bringing ammonia production and distribution into Nebraska, we hope to improve the supply chain and the security for, for ammonia products. Why did we choose uh, Aurora? Um, it checks so very many boxes, you know, for us being here. The, the first and most important thing is that there is a a market that where there is a demand for the uh, for the product for the product. The second thing is is that there is logistic solution to get that product to market. So there's an existing network of uh, distributors. We plan on being a wholesaler. But there are distributors, but most importantly, we are uh, located very close to the end of the New Star Energy Ammonia Pipeline. It's uh, about 0.7 a mile from the proposed site. We propose that the vast majority, it will vary from year to year, excuse me, the vast majority of the ammonia that we produce will just go under Highway 34 by pipeline to join into the new star, existing new star pipeline. Um, we hope that there will be local purchases as well, and uh, we, we plan to distribute liquid ammonia by truck. That will happen you know, twice a year, typically around about a month, in the spring and the fall fertilizer seasons. We anticipate that there will be about four trucks a day, six days a week, it's 24 trucks uh, in, in total in a week, which gives 96 for that month. So very, very low uh, traffic impact, and uh, entrance and egress, the main entrance and egress to the plant will be off highway or sorry, county road south of L. And there will also be uh, entrance on Highway 34, but most of the truck traffic will come in off the county road. Right? Um, one of the things that we have uh, found working here is that we've had a lot of support from the community. It's been very encouraging. Um, we do recognize that there are some kind of concerns, principally around the amount of water that the plant will use. And so, you know, we'd like to actually like to spend most of our time talking about water um, this evening. But so everybody understands, you know, how do we make ammonia? Um, we basically have just three ingredients. We use nitrogen that we pull out of the atmosphere around us. Um, we use electrical energy that we will buy from a Southern Power District um, you know, through retail, um, and, and then we also use water, right? And, um, a lot of that water we also return to, um, you know, to the ground or to the wastewater system as well. Um, so uh, I think there's a lot of reasons for us, the, a lot of reasons for us to be here. We think that this project will really benefit the community because you've got um, you know, increased jobs. We expect to produce somewhere between 55 and 75 long-term permanent jobs. We expect this plant you know, to be here for generations. We would like people to be able to start work at this facility and retire from this facility. 
So you know, we're investing in the community and ourselves for the long term, and absolutely nothing that we would do with this map you know, should, you know, should cause harm. We would harm ourselves as much as anyone else. So um, lots of positives, and of course, the, um, the various tax revenues that come with this map as well. So we anticipate that there could be you know, 7 million property tax revenue in the first year, and up to you know, 30 million over, um, over so life. I would like to introduce Jim Schneider from Walton. <laughs> Jim led the uh, hydrological studies for this project. He will walk you through what that entails. Thank you. All right, good evening, uh, Madam Chairwoman and, and committee. Uh, my name is Jim Schneider. I'm the Vice President at Olson, located at 601 P Street, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, and I also live in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, we were hired um, by Synergen to conduct a specific uh, hybrid geologic evaluation um, that is required um, under the rules and regulations of the Upper Big Blue Natural Resource District. Uh, any water use that's going to exceed 500 acre feet per year is required to uh, conduct and submit one of these evaluations. And I'm, I'm holding the report um, with, with me right now. Uh, we, um, they have a four to six page uh, document that uh, directs uh, the um, approach of, of the hydrologic evaluation. Um, and we followed that uh, approach. Um, I, I will say from the get-go, um, they did also hire a third-party independent peer reviewer who agreed with all of our findings um, in, in this report. So just a real quick um, dive into the, the science that goes into an evaluation like this. So um, fundamental to uh, uh, everything we do um, when we are looking at groundwater is data. Um, and we're so fortunate here in Nebraska um, to have a rich history of very strong groundwater management, um, and that has included over 50 years of data collection. Um, uh, to, to, to give a few examples, every time we, every time we drill a well in Nebraska, that provides data. Um, that well lock goes into the state's database and provides um, additional information. So um, as, as I'm sure you um, could guess, there have been many wells drilled um, in Hamilton County over the 50 to 70 years um, history um, of that process. And so it's a very rich source of data to inform us on the aquifer and uh, the geologic variability in the aquifer. Uh, the other data source that I wanted to highlight are the water level measurements that the Natural Resource District has been taking for uh, at least 40 years, probably longer. Um, they go and do a spring and fall, I believe they still do fall, synoptic measurements across the NRD. And so this basically gives us a sense of how the aquifer, uh, or gives us observation information about the aquifer, how it's, how it's reacted to the human development of its use um, since the 1950s. Um, they're, they're, the water levels go up and down um, with increased use um, and with dry and wet periods. Um, but as you may be familiar, um, the uh, NRD has had a rule in place um, that would trigger allocations if water levels declined below a certain level. Um, and that rule's been in place for, I believe, over 40 years and uh, never been reached. Um, so, uh, uh, but anyway, um, so what we do is assemble a, uh, a set of numerical files that uh, inform a computer simulation. Um, and we, we go through what's called a, a calibration of, of that uh, numerical model. Um, and I'd like to say that that's the process of, of training it to behave like the real world. You know, we know how the aquifer is going up and down over the decades. Um, and if the model uh, reproduces uh, what we've observed, then we can um, conclude from a scientific standpoint that it's a useful tool. Um, to evaluate um, uh, things such as a large water user um, uh, uh, beginning to, to pump additional groundwater in an area. 
Um, one of the things I wanted to highlight as well about the hydrogeologic evaluation um, and the rules is we are required to look at every single well in a three mile area. Um, and in the report there are tables that look like this. Um, every, every well that has been registered with the state, um, which would only exclude potentially domestic wells that were drilled prior to 1993. Every well that's been registered with the state in that three mile area, it actually takes four pages. Um, these are all irrigation, commercial, industrial, domestic wells. We look at the depth of the well, the static water level and the pumping water level, the screen interval where available, um, and make an independent assessment for every single well of the impact of this large water use um, on that well. And in general, um, the vast majority of, of the results indicate a uh, two to three percent reduction in the saturated, um, the, 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 the static saturated interval within these wells. So sure, there will be some drawdowns, um, generally uh, uh, confined to um, one to three feet, um, being as high as 10 to 14 feet, um, right on the, the proposed project site. Um, but from the standpoint of the existing wells, um, there does not appear that it will um, cause any, any harm um, to those wells. Uh, and um, just basically uh, from that, um, we conclude that um, the, the expected um, impacts to the groundwater supply and pumping capacities at existing wells should be minimal and should not affect their operations. And I'm reading that from the, the conclusion of this, this report. Um, the NRG uh, took our report, took the report that their consultant um, produced as a peer review report um, under consideration, um, as well as the, the board received uh, guidance from their staff. And following that, they uh, approved the well permit for synergy. Happy to be here, and um, I don't think this is the time for questions, but if there are any later, I'd be happy to answer them. Is there anyone else who wants to speak for the project? Hello, Madam Chairman and the rest of the Planning Commission members. I am Kelsey Bergen, and I am the Executive Director of Aurora Development Corporation. We are located at the Bremer Center, which is 1604 L Street here in Aurora. And I am here today to show support for the Synergym project on behalf of my board of directors, our 65 supporting businesses, who many of them are here today, as well as our 225 shareholders, because this is a project that holds great promise for Hamilton County. I was a member of a local committee that was um, assigned to start working on this project in September of 2022 um, when it was first introduced to us by the Nebraska Department of Economic Development. Um, and they, at that time, all projects kind of have a code name. This one was called Project Renewable NH3. So through the time frame since we learned about this project and we've seen this project continue to grow and evolve, um, it has transpired like almost every other economic project that is out there. Um, and as things for this project continued to solidify and come together, it was able to go public in January. And we began to talk with our local community members about the project. Um, our, my committee talked with business leaders, community leaders, workers in the area, our largest employers, farmers, businesses in the ag industry, developers, utility providers, and even in the last couple weeks, we went as far as to post on Facebook that individuals who want to know more about the project, who have had concerns and would like to talk about it in more depth, were welcome to call my office for more information. So tonight I want to share some of the three um, main themes that we discussed with these individuals on those calls and conversations and share what we have saw following this process and also what we have heard from the community. First and foremost, um, everyone wanted to know about ammonia production 
And since John has already talked about um, the project and kind of what it looks like, and I know your packet is very detailed, I won't spend time touching on this, but we did go over um, for those people within and around the agricultural community, community and also those that know nothing about um, fertilizer that is put in the ground, we talked with them about the process, um, how it works in our area and how it's used. Secondly, as most people um, are not surprised, I'm sure, is that people wanted to talk about the water usage. Um, as Jim said, uh, through his um, account of the hydrological study, um, it was a in-depth study um, that not only looked at the project in the next couple of years, but over a long time span. So I'm not gonna expand on the information he already shared, um, but I can say that in working alongside this project and watching it through every step of the process, um, and a, as part of the evaluation, as a committee we realize that we are not experts in water, um, and so that we have, to we have to trust the decision of the NRD. Um, the NRD board exists for a reason, and they have a lengthy and thorough process for studying and vetting water sources, especially large water users, and so in seeing that process acted out in real life, um, it's something that we um, trust. It is, um, just for those of you that haven't walked alongside a project for a large water user, I was not aware of the process, um, but it takes about six months um, and there's multiple meetings with the NRD, several rounds of studies, as well as various reviews. Um, so we started off with Olson Associates. They were hired, and there was an initial review process to see if it was even uh, logical to undergo the full hydrological study. Following that initial analysis and a meeting with the NRD staff, the green light was given to move forward with a full study, and that took another few months, um, which is largely what Jim um, talked about. Once the full hydrological review was complete, another meeting with the NRD staff um, was held to discuss the findings and to see if it was even possible to move forward with the third party review and ultimately onto the board. I think something that's very important for everyone to realize is that projects where the hydrological evaluation shows a significant impact on the aquifer or surrounding water users are not even allowed to have the third party review or go before the NRD board. So I can say by watching this um, experience from every stage of the process over six months um, that everybody in the committee and everyone else was also pleasantly surprised um, by the, uh, the, sh the study's ability to show the aquifer in this area and how it was able to use the uh, size of the water use. And that is the end of my time. Okay, is there anybody else here that's for this? Hello? My name is Janelle Syme. I'm at 2104 M Street here in Aurora. I'm also the president of Aurora Housing Development Corporation, which is a volunteer uh, board nonprofit that works on the workforce housing needs of Aurora and Hamilton County. I wanted to express my support of this project. Um, I think, as Kelsey has said, that um, a group of people smarter than me has have um, determined that this is a good fit for our community. But I did want to address the concerns of, um, that I read, read basically on Facebook about uh, this project and the impact on housing in, in Aurora and Hamilton County. I think that we have um, spent the last probably four years preparing for this. We didn't know what this was, but this is what it is. We knew that we were going to have an economic boom at some point. We were due. The cycle happens every 20 years or so, and Aurora was ready um, to address that. We have developed an entire tract of land um, by Westfield and the west side of Aurora. We have 40 lots that are currently available for development. We've also, throughout Hamilton County in the last three years, have um, built over 30, or are in the process of building over 30 um, units and with an apartment building uh, breaking ground this month um, for the next 30 days. We also have um, put in grants for another uh, 20 apartment, uh, a, a 20 plex apartment complex um, and are speaking with investors every day. I had two meetings today with investors that are interested in building 
multifamily units or single family housing in Aurora. It's consistently on our um, radar. We also have extra land where we have already developed that we can develop further and bring in 60 more lots if necessary. Um, we are crying, we are pumped, we are ready for this. I do not think that housing needs to be um, a concern when considering this. And I'll be happy to answer any questions after this is all done. Thank you. Anyone else for? Madam Chairman and the Planning Commission. My name is Mike Bergen, 404 South T Road, Aurora, Nebraska, 68818. Um, I serve as president of Hamilton County Corn Growers, and I'm here today to show support for the ammonia project. This initiative holds immense promise for our local agricultural community and aligns with the core values and the goals for the future of crop production in Nebraska with Nebraska Corn Growers Association. I want to share how this project aligns from a policy standpoint, how it reduces reliance on imports, and how it will support cost stabilization and provide economic benefit to farmers. At the Nebraska Corn Growers Association, we stand firmly, we believe firmly um, that initiatives to enhance domestic competition within fertilizer uh, manufacturing sector. This ammonia project represents the type of opportunity and aligns with our policy objectives, creating a more competitive landscape for fertilizer production right here at home. We, curr we currently rely on imports from Russia, the Middle East, and Trinidad to have enough ammonia to fertilize our ground each year. Statistically speaking, the Midwest imports 1.2 million metric tons of ammonia and Nebraska imports over 660,000 uh, metric tons of ammonia each year. Continuing to depend on imports put our farmers at a disadvantage from a price and risk standpoint. Having a local source for ammonia will help our supply chain and reduce our dependence on foreign <coughs> countries. As farmers, we understand that all too well the financial challenges associated with fluctuating input, input costs. Fertilizer expenses represent a substantial portion of our budget, making any efforts to stabilize these costs incredibly value to every operation. Having ammonia produced locally creates greater stability in fertilizer prices, a benefit that directly impacts the bottom line of every farmer in Hamilton County. We have witnessed firsthand the positive impact of local industrial growth like the ethanol plant just west of town can have on our bottom line from a farm revenue standpoint. Having a local source for ammonia will positively impact the input side of our farming operation which continues to enhance the profitability for local farmers. Farmers and landowners in rural Nebraska are tasked with carrying much of the real estate and property tax burden in our state to support our counties, schools, and other taxing entities. Opening the door to new industries help us take the pressure off the back of farmers as it grows the tax base through development. As an example, I own, 40, I own 80 acres of farm ground south of Aurora on Highway 14 and pay approximately $4,600 each year in property tax. As comparison, the Imes plant pays more than a half million dollars in property personal property and real estate taxes on only 40 acres. Adding this type of growth to the tax base benefits farmers and property owners all throughout Hamilton County. This project represents a tr tremendous opportunity for our county and the broader agricultural industry. By supporting this project, we not only embrace innovation and progress, but we also pave the way for a more sustainable and prosperous future for generations of farmers in Hamilton County. If my boys choose to come back and farm as adults, the world of farming will look completely different for them in 10 years than, than when I started. I know this because farming looks much different today than 18 years ago when I started. 
There will be new technology, new regulations, new efficiencies, and changes we haven't even thought of. Everything we can do along the way to give future farmers a competitive advantage and minimize their risks, such as having a local source of ammonia, will help set them up for success. Uh, Thank anyone you. that would like to speak against this item? Please step forward. Can you hear me now? Okay. My name is Ann Ashburn. I live at 703 M Street here in Aurora. Um, thank you for uh, allowing us to come in and voice our concerns. Um, I heard about this about three weeks ago. And some of the research that I did around the concern of water use was uh, alarming to me. And I'm not sure that the study actually did anything to look outside of Nebraska. There are eight states that actually access the aquifer. We're using, personally, for the farming, 32 billion gallons annually. Each person uses 40,000 gallons per year, so the population in Nebraska alone uses 68 million dollars, not dollars, million gallons of water. Um, environmentalists have also told us that within 50 years, this water is going to be depleted because it's non-renewable. With the uh, climate change, we're not getting the snow, there is no filter, and the attrition to that is so great that over the last four years, we've seen a depletion of 325 billion gallons. That is, basically equates to a third of Lake Erie or 18 Colorado rivers, which is a huge amount, and that isn't even the end of it. We have over 200,000 wells that are pumping using for irrigation, um, and the farmers, besides the 320 billion, are using 273 million um, through these um, wells. Most of this data came from Texas A&M data, so, and I can up, uh, supply references if you'd like that. I didn't see anywhere where the study or the information that Synergetic gave us talked about inclusion of all of these uses. It's basically just their use. And they say they're going to conclude this within 50 years, which means there's going to be a depletion of our natural resources during that time. We know that through um, the depression, this was a dust bowl. After that is when we started accessing water for irrigating the land from the aquifer. And it has been used extensively, not only in Nebraska, but Oklahoma and Kansas used, they rely on this aquifer for 92% of their water resources. So considering that we're not the only one, I'd really like to see data that includes all of the states that are drawing from this and the individual use so that we can have a true picture of, you know, where is the water going to be? Are we going to be here? How would do we really care if we have all this additional tax revenue, if it's not going to be sustainable past 50 years? I'm not going to be here. My kids might not be here, but my great grandchildren will be and my granddaughter will be. And I would like for them to have the viability to stay in Nebraska and have the livelihood. I don't see that, you know, and I don't see it being presented where it's going to be available for them. I don't know if my battery ran out. That means I talked too long. <laughs> Another thing that I heard um, 
was we're importing. The United States is the fourth largest manufacturer in the world for ammonia. We have plants in South Dakota, we have plants in Oklahoma, we have plants down in Texas, and all of these are actually using the aquifer to produce. So if we're importing, why on earth would we be importing from Russia? Now, Russia is first in manufacturing, India is second in manufacturing, then there, uh, Trinidad, Tobago happen to be up there, they're like third, but we're tied fourth with another con uh, country, and I don't remember what it is right now. But I don't understand why we wouldn't be using our own um, state resources for um, ammonia. Why would we have to import? It's bound to be less expensive. Now, besides that, I'm concerned about the output and how it would damage the soil. We know that ammonia takes more of uh, the, excuse me, now. sorry, I'm really dry. Can you address us, please? Okay, sorry, I want them to understand. I know, but uh, address us, please. Um, we know that- Can't hear her. I understand that, but we don't have batteries right now. The most fertilizer drives out more than using natural fertilizer. And environmentalists have been testing different processes that are more natural for um, manufacturing corn manufacturing soy. The products that we manufacture right now represent $35 billion annually. And we don't, we haven't used the a new ammonia plant. We're using existing. And I do think that we should consider why are we importing if we're importing from Russia or India because we don't need to. We've got enough right here. Adopted in 2018 on page 73, 
there is a section titled Prime Farmland. According to this plan, it refers to the importance of prime farmland and that the USDA encourages all levels of government and individuals that they, quote, must encourage and facilitate the wise use of our nation's prime farmland, unquote. The property that is along Highway 34 is definitely defined as prime farmland. Please refer to the handout I've given you, which has full descriptions and a chart of prime farmland in Hamilton County. In the Hamilton County Zoning Resolutions adopted in 2019 on page 76, there is a section titled Transitional Agricultural District. This section states, the intent of this district is to recognize the transition between agricultural uses of land and communities to encourage the continued use of that land, which is suitable for agriculture, but limit the land uses that may be a detriment to the efficient pursuit of agricultural production. In Hamilton County's own zoning regulations require the continued use and preservation of land as agricultural production. In this specific situation, we are taking another 160 acres of prime farm ground, farm ground out of production and covering it with concrete and asphalt. I have also included a map that shows the aquifer in the area that we have been referring to is in the yellow zone, which shows that there has been a decline of 10 to 25 feet. This map was created by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, titled National Climate Assessment of the Great Plains Ogallala Aquifer Drying Out. Lastly, I am very concerned about what kind of precedent we are setting here. What's to keep other large corporations from taking advantage of our water resources in the future if we allow this one? How many more industrial facilities do we want in Hamilton County using our limited aquifer? I urge you to please look at the map that I provided you showing the serious declines to the aquifer throughout Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas, and realize that we may be going down the same path. Thank you for your time. Good evening, I'm Gail Hearns, uh, battery man. <laughs> I live across the street, 200 South 8th Street. I have my own well, it's not really deep. I'm very concerned that this may cause me to have to drill a deeper well. I also am concerned that, uh, do we know how much water the city of Aurora uses? All these wells are registered in the county. Do we know how much water the, the wells drill are used and how much is that compared to what they're going to use? Uh, it really concerns me because the water is a very limited qu uh, qu quantity. After Lewis and Clark did their expedition to the West, the government uh, had a person do a study of the water. And this was way back when, and I can't remember his name, but he said that eventually between the Mississippi River and the mountains, we are going to run out of water. It, it does concern me. It's a very valuable commodity. And another question is, if this plant goes in, and produces ammonia, is it going to help our farmers by getting them to lower price mm, no. and make it better for us? Thank you. Sorry, I'm Justin Elch, uh, 1512 8th Street, Aurora. Um, I farm with my dad uh, right east of where this is going to be proposed to go in. Um, my biggest concern is there's never been a water use permit of this size in the Big Blue. Um, as uh, Ruth mentioned, you know, the last five years were not included in the study where we pumped a lot more water. Um, what's going to happen if this crop continues and we see farmers going to allocation, but industrial will be limited to 100% of the previous three years use, mm -hmm. which is what the current rules say. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm concerned that Synergy may draw down more water than what they're saying, and 
we have an issue and it's going to affect farmers more than it's going to affect them if allocation goes in um, due to the current rules at the Big Blue. Um, the uh, other thing that concerns me is synergy and permit calls for this large substation to be built south of their plant. Um, who's paying for this to go in? Is the power company paying for it and passing the rates on to us? So all the residents in Hamilton County have to pay more for our domestic electricity use, our irrigation well electricity use. Um, you know, who's going to pay for these transmission lines to be upgraded? I don't see this as a benefit to our community. Thank you. Turn the mic on. Push it all the way up. Okay, I'm Marcellus Walk. I live at 1305 West Dead Road. I'm just outside of the three mile radius that they were you know, talking about water growing out. Um, I'm concerned about my house level. I'm also concerned about if they could send water back in. Is that going to contaminate my water? The other thing is, do we want to just send this water down to Beaver Creek or the Lincoln Creek to waste water? I mean, the NRD says they can't do anything with it. And that, I find that kind of strange because if we run irrigation water off our fields, we get in trouble. Also, I've noticed that the beavers this is a lot of the subject, but I've noticed that the beavers are building bigger and higher dams, which to me indicates a dry summer this year. And I also have friends out in south or north west Kansas. They have to decide whether they're going to irrigate a quarter of a circle or half of a circle in order to raise the crop anymore. Because the well water is so limited. So that's all I have to write. Yep, uh, my name is Curtis Junt, and I hail to you all from North Dakota. And you're wondering why in the heck I'm here? I'm down here on other matters, and I have friends here um, involved in this in Hamilton County. I read the 56 page report, and there are a lot of questions that I have, and I'm going to address a few of those for for this council commission. Uh, excuse me, uh, Madam Chair, I should have addressed you. Um, big concern I have is also the water. I would love to see the the study that was done as a reservoir engineer. I would love to see that study. Somebody just answered my question. I've been sitting here asking, has there ever been this big of a drawdown in the area? I'm dealing with so much of this green, 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 and it's not the green, green grass at home. It's green this, green that, green everything, and I'm dealing with it up in North Dakota. Um, as a natural gas expert and coming from the fossil fuel industry, that doesn't make me against anything green. But we also have a green anhydrous ammonia facility going in, substantially larger than this. We have a huge carbon capture project going in. We have direct air capture going in. And I've been called on to help landowners that are, are the ones in the path of all of this. And it's not just where the easements for all of this are being, or the land that's being sold, the beneficiaries, if you will, that are getting the mula mula. But I mean, all the, we went to a meeting here in December that was put on by a lot of our um, politicians that are for a lot of this green stuff. And at the very end of it, we were told that, you know, we have to sacrifice for the greater good. Now, we're dealing with CO2, extremely dangerous, and hydrous ammonia, of course, it's a little lighter than air, but if you have a humid morning and you have fog, that's going to drip pretty close to the ground and can be pretty lethal and asphyxiant also. The emergency response needs to be looked at and make sure that, that your county is not paying for emergency response costs that could be associated with this, that your county is not paying for increased road repair that's from these heavy trucks 
that your county citizens are not being put at risk for traffic. Um, let me talk about the power. Your power down here is provided by the Southwest Power Pool. I'm dealing with an issue, same power pool, you look at it, it runs all the way up into western North Dakota. About four years ago, we had, uh, promoted by our governor, we had a crypto, I call it cryptic mining, it's a crypto mining data center that came, like all these other projects, a lot of state people, a lot of foreign investment, and of course, we're the ones that all have to suffer for it. So, uh, this thing comes into North Dakota, guess what our electric rates have been doing? like never before. This thing is using 260 megawatts. I have an article that I can actually share with anybody here that was published in December talking about the, the shortfall that's going to happen winter 23-24 if we have a normal winter in peak conditions. Southwest Power Pool that serves you all short 8,500 megawatts. MISO that feeds right next to Southwest Power Pool short 16,000 megawatts. Well, I would say by good fortune, but I don't really see a good fortune because you didn't have to fall off a turnip, turnip truck to know that we are in a drought. North Dakota, all the way down, I've traveled extensively the last three months through the, every state from North Dakota down through Texas and all over. It is dry as a popcorn fart. And this aquifer that you're talking about, I was, I, again, I will study this Ogallala, whatever, however you pronounce it, aquifer, but I'm guessing it's recharged from the mountains somewhere. But we could be entering a period that you all have not experienced where these irrigation pivot irrigators that we see zillions of, you're the, the biggest corn producing irrigation state uh, and counties around here, but we could have irrigators going on and drawdowns of this reservoir that we haven't seen in a long time. I would, one of the things I keep talking about up north and all of what we're dealing with is the unintended consequences. I hear all the benefits, the home builders, the city, hey, we got money, we're, we're getting all the benefit, that's great. But then who are the ones nearby all of us that are suffering the impact? It, that's what's happened in our country. As long as it's benefiting me, uh, I'm sorry, to, you know, you have to pay a little bit of the price. But thank you, and this is what's wrong. That isn't how I grew up in the 60s and 70s. We actually cared about our neighbors and tried not to do things that would be detrimental to them. So the water and the power are two things, and they said they're gonna possibly put in a gas fired power generation station. But this, this idea that Nevada, uh, ne Nebraska Power has approved this thing, I'm telling you, this is going to impact all of your electric rates, mark my word, because it's happening to us in North Dakota and Eastern Montana, and it's gonna happen to you all here. So I think that's the main thing I have for you. Um, I'm kind of neutral on this, but, um, one of the things, when you read the 56 pages, Reagan said, trust but verify. I'm asking all of you to do your homework and, and for the citizens here, and actually for these folks to maybe have a better project, ask the questions, do the research, trust but verify everything you read. And I'd love to see that water report, by the way. Thank you. Madam Chairman, I'm Kurt Friesen, 2209 East Southern Road, Henderson. So I live uh, just on the eastern or southeastern edge of the county. Um, uh, this issue here is uh, one of those, um, so I'll give you a little bit of history. I served uh, a number of years ago after Big Blue NRD. I was uh, part of the group that set our groundwater regulations and we wrote the large water user uh, study uh, that we currently have implemented in the Upper Big Blue. So again, we, um, I guess your job is really not to look at whether or not the water use, I think the NRD has um, the authority to look at water use in our state, and I think they've done a really good job of implementing this. They have denied large water users in the past if it shows a, a, a bad impact on the aquifer. And so they're not afraid to uh, deny permits, and they do study this. They do look at the, the, the hydrology of the area, the geologic formations, and I do trust their ability to set that uh, large water use requirement for those permits. We are in a drought. We've uh, probably not experienced a drought quite like this in a few years, 
but as an ag producer, we use less water all the time. We have switched to pivots. Um, we have conserved lots of water, and I think we can do an even better job down the road. But we have to remember, as farmers and ag producers and irrigators, that Nebraska has what they call correlative rights. It's share and share alike. And one thing in our discussions on water policy in the years past has been that if we are going to deny a job creation or economic development opportunities and we're going to say, no, you can't have that water, that is, that's not how the state works. That's not how we should work. We are continuously losing farmers in this area. Our farms are consolidating, our kids are moving away. We need job creation. This, to me, um, you want to look at strictly as that, it's, it's job creation. We're going to be able to bring some people back to, to work at these facilities. And you can say it could be any facility. I don't care what kind of job creation we have here. This just happens to be fertilizer manufacturing, which uh, as an egg producer, we've talked about for years, trying to get uh, more production manufactured in the U.S. rather than imported from foreign countries. So I, I look at this and I, I think of you know all the data mining that we talked about in electricity rates. Well, I think too our electric rates are going to go up, um, but we're also putting in these data centers which really don't create any jobs, and all they do is data mining and Bitcoin, blockchain, those types of things. They don't do as much good as what a manufacturing plant is creating jobs for. Us. And I think that you as a zoning board, I think you've looked at all the issues. You're, you're looking at this, whether or not it fits the area, whether or not it's an industrial area, it's located on a highway. Those are the things I think that should concern you. I think the water issues that uh, the NRD will take care of, those issues um, have been addressed. Um, again, we are going to, in the long term, have to address probably our electricity manufacturing. Um, me and Mr. Levy have been on opposite sides of numerous things in the past, but this is one thing we agree on here is, is manufacturing, I think, is good for rural areas. I've complained um, when I served time in Lincoln that all of our economic development has been focused on the eastern part of the state. This is finally giving us an opportunity to create some jobs, and I think they're going to be good, well-paying jobs. So when you, when you start to weigh whether or not we want to do this or not do this, um, first of all, I, I fully support this, whether it be probably any other manufacturing or not, I'd probably support that too. Um, I think the, the most important thing we look at is, is job creation, and I, I think the rest of it, the NRDs will take care of the water use portions of it, the, the electric utilities, are gonna, they're going to look out for our electric use here. So those are the things that I look at, and I've been hearing the concerns back here. But again, if we don't start to create jobs in this area, we're going to continue to see smaller schools, smaller tax base, and we're going to be paying the price. Thank you. Can you hear me? My name is Anthony Bowati, 1618 Road, 1150 North Nebraska, 68467. Um, Madam Chairman and members of the Planning and Zoning Committee. And my name is Anthony Bohati, and I'm here today on behalf of myself as a Hamilton County farmer, Hamilton County landowner, and stakeholder. I want to disclose I am a current board member of the Upper Big Blue NRD. I am not speaking on their behalf tonight. I have not been asked to speak on them, nor am I authorized to. And nor do any of my views being presented tonight represent their views and opinions. So I'm here on my own. Speaking as Anthony Bowati, I live in York County. My wife Carmen and I have a long history of our extended families living and farming in Seward, York, and Hamilton County. My wife Carmen and I have four school-aged children, and my hope is that when they grow up, they will continue to live and work in this community and have safe and plentiful groundwater available to them, just like I have had for most of my life. For these reasons, I felt compelled to come forward today and to try to protect our natural resources for my children and for all the other future generations. It is vital that our natural resources be used in a way that they are not wasted or used purely for quick profit of an outside foreign entity or for the future promises of increased tax dollars and new jobs all based on an unproven government subsidized pro process and product. 
We must be cautious not to overuse our groundwater at a rate that may exceed the ability of the aquifer to naturally recharge. Water depletion and modeling done by the state and the NRDs is not an exact science. Nobody can be certain and know what the long-term effect of a large water withdrawal in a concentrated area will do to the availability of our local water supply. These concerns have weighed very heavy on my mind the last few weeks, and that is why I've come to you tonight to voice these concerns. I am very concerned that the Synergy and Green plant will build a facility that would require up to 3 billion gallons of groundwater pumped daily from the Ogallala Aquifer. As an illustration, that is the same quantity of water that is required to apply nine inches of water annually to 4,400 acres of farmland. It's a lot. Synergy and Green is proposing withdrawing all that water within a small area with four wells to be located on, from what I understand, 160 acres of farmland. The cap ethanol plant, which is about three miles from there, from the proposed plant, has an average daily water use of 1.2 million gallons per day. The ice company has an average of 3,700. Irrigation from crops occurs approximately five months out of the year. Synergen will be pumping all year, every day, without limitation, as long as they do not exceed their permitted amount. The permitted amount will only, or will be allowed until they develop a three-year pumping history. If the area would become water allocated, they would be allowed to pump the full amount of their permit if no water history has yet been developed. Once they have a pumping history, they would be allowed to currently pump the full amount of their history, even if air sure was under an allocation. As a farmer in Hamilton County, the allocation of water for irrigation is becoming closer to reality as each year has passed. I am very concerned about the declining level, declining level of the water, local water aquifer. The spring 2023 groundwater level was still 6.68 feet from the allocation trigger level. From what I understand, it fell about 2.21 feet from the spring 2022 to the spring 2023 measurement. Now what's interesting about that is that I believe the allocation use or the amount reported was about maybe seven to eight inches and models have shown that the aquifer shouldn't fall when you pump that. So that really makes me question what models do. There is no allocation for the 2024 year. We will not know until two, about 2025 until the spring 2024 level is completed. If agriculture goes into an allocation, due to the decline in water level, the large water users will not be allocated as the rules currently set, from what I've read, as long as they do not exceed their history or the permit request. Things I want to leave you to think about. Does anyone truly understand how much the water table could have fallen in this area of the proposed plant if they had been operating the last three years during the current Nebraska drought pattern we are in? Would we already be in allocation? Why is an outside ent entity allowed to come into Hamilton County and potentially waste water by releasing or recharging or whatever they are going to do, they won't say, when we as a community are concerned about our fallen water table? Do we want to take this risk as a community for the hope of economic development, new jobs, and tax dollars? I too want those, but at what cost? And if we do, like I said, at what cost to our environment? As a stakeholder of the community, I do not want this area to be faced with the same problems they are now seeing in southwest Kansas and eastern Colorado. The less water we remove from the aquifer, the more likely we will preserve this resource for the future. In summary, I personally am not against this project. May I finish? I'm so asking questions and collecting information, but I challenge this group to think hard, move slowly, and take your time before making a decision. Thank you. Moved and seconded to close the public hearing. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Motion passed. Mm -hmm. Item number four discussion action conditional use permit for Synergy and Green Energy to construct an ammonia distri distribution facility west of Aurora on northeast quarter 
in Section 3, T10, R7W in the Transitional Agricultural District. Are there any questions from the Planning Commission on the amendment? <coughs> I would also like to disclose that if anybody has any ex parte from anyone that has spoken, please announce that now. Um, I did receive text messages from Angie Joyce, a messenger from Tina Oswald. I did reach out to the newspaper for the link for um, the information that I requested from the last meeting at the Bremer Center. Did anybody else get anything from anybody that would... It's not going to change my opinion on how I feel on what's going on, but did anybody else get any information from anybody? You received one from Tina Oswald as well, Justin. Greg, right. did you receive anything? I, um, I did from uh, Iris Bergen, but I thought my wife was bringing it. We, we don't need it. We just need to know that it's been been presented to you. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Are there any questions on the amendment from the Planning Commission? When is the appropriate time for us to ask questions? Is it this, this moment or is it? Right now we can ask questions, yes. <clears throat> Yeah, I have a question for John Hewitt. Um, can you can you give me an honest answer in regard to the ownership of this company? Uh, I want you to go back to um, you have subsidiaries, right? you um, you have Synergen, who is the parent company? I mean, let's get down to the brass tacks. Who owns the company? So, Citizen Green Energy is a U.S. Uh, company that's registered in the state of Texas. Turn the mic on. It is on. Okay. 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 So, Citizen Green Energy is a U.S. company that's registered in the state of Texas. Green. It's actually in Houston. Um, it's a new company, and uh, they opened an office just uh, uh, about a year ago in, in um, it's a family-owned business, and the uh, current generation of the Sandy family, who are the owners, are all here in the U.S. They are um, of Indian origin, but they are all uh, U.S. citizens and have been for quite some time. And you know, their, their future and their investment is here in the in the U.S. So they are a U.S. company, U.S. citizens. Um, the Citizen is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Skiron Group, which is owned by that same family, who also have members who are um, in India. But Citizen Green Energy is a U.S. registered company and it has all its operations here in the U.S. So in regard to that, if they are a, you, did you call them a subsidiary of? They are part of a, a, a holding group called the Skiron Group. It is a U.S. registered company. We registered. The holding group is a, where is the home of the holding group? The holding group. Attorney, that uh, it is my understanding that 
that the permit has no basis in the nationality of the holding company. We, the county has no authority to um, discriminate against applicants. Would you address that? If the um, company's legal entities are lawfully incorporated in the United States and can't do business, it doesn't matter where the shareholders are. Think about a company that's registered on the New York Stock Exchange. There could be people anywhere in the world owning stock in that company, and it's still a U.S. company. Great. Do you have other questions? This question would be for, I don't know, why, why do we not have this water study? I, I, see, I see nothing in my information that tells me the impact upon the farms in the immediate vicinity. Why, why do I not see that? Uh, we submitted the uh, the study to NRD, they are the, the authority dealing with that. Um, and the study is available to anybody through the NRD, and we did explain that to the Planning Commission quite some time ago, and we've explained that to the public during our open hearings. So the, the model is at NRD, everybody is welcome to, um, to have access to that model and contact the NRD. That, they're the people who know how to use it best. I have a question for uh, Tina Oswald. Thank you. Tina, we have to understand, part of our job is to understand the impact upon the local the immediate area you identified yourself as immediate in the immediate area of this project can you um can you tell me how you how you see this a potentially is injurious to your property um well several ways um one the traffic that will be on l road that's the road that we travel is one way um the um, other way that it could be injurious is our property values. If we have to be allocated with our watering and, and, and our production is not what it can be, um, so that would be another way. It would also be injurious with the draining and runoff if it goes through our 40 acres. Um, so those are a few of the ways that it would be injurious to our immediate property, property as well as our household wells. We have um, two households, actually, that are within uh, if, if you look at where we live, we had built a house um, and then just re recently we remodeled and moved into the original farmhouse. So we actually have a couple of personal household wells that are right there. Um, so that would be another way. What's your comment about having to drive by it? Can you explain that? To drive by it? Um, yes. I. Living in the country, I would much rather drive by in the country and look at country landscape instead of a commercial landscape. Um, in some of the regulations for the planning um, and zoning for here in Hamilton County, um, it said that um, the transitional use was not supposed to be for large commercial um, entities, and that to me this is a large commercial entity, and I would be driving by that every day. Are there any other members that have any questions? Let's let everybody else speak and then we need to add more if we can. We had a discussion about wastewater. Where's that going? We didn't ever discuss where that wastewater is going to go. Wastewater, I 
I think we have explained this to the best of our ability um, on a few occasions. But the answer to that is the, that there are three options for wastewater. Uh, all three options are under evaluation. Nothing has been decided at this point. But the options are, first of all, that the water could go to uh, city water. Um, and we've already been in contact with Aurora City Water and talked about what that could mean in terms of um, existing infrastructure and potential infrastructure upgrades, you know, how that would be financed, what the rates would be, etc. So, so that is still in a, in a relatively early discovery stage. The second option is, is that the, um, the wastewater that we produce is actually exceptionally clean. Right. Um, and that wastewater is clean enough that it can be uh, run off to existing bodies of water. There's a, there's a, so it could go into creeks and things in, in the uh, immediate surrounding area. Um, just so people are, we can ask the question, why can that water not continue to be reused? Just because it gets to a harmless content that says we can't use it for cooling, so we have to let it run off. Um, and that's, that's about 500,000 gallons of that. Um, and the, the third option is that the water could actually be re-injected back into the ground. But there are issues with that in terms of you know, technical issues and environmental issues as well. Um, but all three of those options are possible. All three of those options are being evaluated. Um, but you know, you know, no decision will be made on that, at least until we know that there is you know, still a, a viable project. To follow up on that question, where will it go? As a commission member, I'm really challenged to make a decision without knowing that information. Because everybody is concerned about runoff and about where water will end up in our drinking water where will it end up so i'm just i'm just saying for me i would have liked to have a plan that we knew where it was going to go instead of we have three options i understand your points and you know, we would like to have more clarity on the two but you know we're also waiting for information from different bodies as to what possibilities are such as you know rural water also working with us, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, part of this conditional use permit is, is you, know, you can help us understand what choices could be available to us. I think the, the, the sensible answer is, is that the, uh, you know, wh whatever solution we uh, decide upon has to be environmentally friendly. We have to be responsible with where it goes. And of course, we're looking at what we can collectively consider to be the most socially responsible and economically beneficial uh, outcome for the project, right? And that doesn't just mean synergy. The project means in the community and complying with the use of permits. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? So I guess my question would be, if, and I'm not a, a resident in Aurora itself, but if you guys are saying maybe their wastewater treatment plant or this or that, and you ain't got a plan yet, and you said expansion for them, well, I guess my question is who pays for that? Because the, the people in, in Aurora are gonna get bigger tax dollars and have to pay for it for you guys' runoff? Is Hamilton County's tax dollars gonna go up? Because of runoff, I mean, I'm, I'm like other people. I don't think all the ducks are in a row here. It's kind of hard to make a decision. Yep. I mean, I'm not against more jobs and more people coming to our community and sharing it with them. But not knowing where the wastewater is going and the surrounding communities already have a high nitrate and stuff because we don't have enough water coming to us. 
I mean, my small village of a town, we're already trying to figure out what we're doing for a treatment plant. So is this going to affect? So um, I'm going to answer it as fully as I can at the moment, right? Because I don't speak for the, author the Aurora City Water Authorities or, or anybody in that area. We have had um, initial meetings and discussions with, with Aurora. Um, at the present time, they have sufficient capacity in the existing system to take all of the wastewater that we produce if we gave it to them. Right? Um, but they, like everybody else, you know, like the Chamber of Commerce lady here, etc., is they're already doing their plan because they're expecting expansion at some stage, um, whether it's from synergy or not. So they're already saying that we have to look to the future and possibly expand. Part of the discussion that they've had that they brought to us is this is an opportunity for us to improve our existing services and our capacity, right? They've also been looking at, and this was before we ever arrived, at rerouting existing sewers and so on, right? Which would bring numerous benefits that they could tell you about. If we were to participate with them, then it would accelerate that program and it would also, you know, um, mean that we could share in the capital costs for that. But if we were to do that, then just the same as everybody else, we would expect that we would see rates for that, if we would pay our rates. But there would probably be some rate adjustment to make sure that you know everything is equitable for everybody at the end of the day. But that is for them to decide. And you know they set the rates, they tell us what it is that we have to comply with. And we put all of that into our our options to say which is the best solution for this project and this community. So it's normal business practice. What we will go through. On you know you said you had you know multiple third party people that are looking at you know three different options you have do you have a time frame on you know, potentially when is that decision going to be made as far as what option are you going to go with? Um, so it, it's kind of a iterative process. You know, when we get our conditional use permit, assuming we would be successful, we hope we are getting a conditional use permit. Our next stage is to move into detailed engineering on the project, because we're still at a relatively um, early stage. We've done what we call our pre-feed engineering, then we have detailed engineering. That could take many months, and water is just part of that. So it will go backwards and forwards, and it could take quite some months before we decide what the final outcome is. But please understand that is not anything that Synergen does in a dark room on its own. It's you know, completely interactive because we have to work with Aurora City Water, we have to work with the environmental agencies, etc., and comply with their regulations before a decision is made. It could take months. I would assume with that you would have to probably check with other local landowners as far as if that water is going to run off down to the creeks. And yes, you're quite right. I mean, we don't go just where we want to, right? We have to consider everything. I got a question for the guy that did the hydraulics study. Hoskin, you only used 1941 to 2018. Why didn't you go to current? We've had pretty much three dry years in a row. It's not even on this study. Yeah, so um, I, I'd like to read the, 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 the full sentence um, that was referred to. Um, and then I'll, I'll help explain that. Um, I'll start. I'll start a little earlier. The first step was to construct the sub-regional model using regional model files supplied by GSI Environmental, um, which is uh, uh, one of the consultants that worked with the Upper Big Blue on um, developing their regional model. And 
um, we had assisted with the peer review. The second part of the model development involved creating a steady state simulation followed by a simulation of a transient period from 1941 to 2018 to ensure the model's capability to replicate changing water level conditions in the local aquifer. So what that means um, is by um, simulating over, let me do some quick math, about an 80 year period, we're capturing numerous droughts um, and numerous wet and dry cycles. Um, and um, there's really nothing nefarious about the fact that we stopped in 2018. It simply is the last year where water use um, estimates, in particular from uh, irrigation water use, um, are available. And that was dependent on the NRD's um, larger modeling study. Um, so we were dependent on, on how they did that larger modeling study. Um, and so um, that's the, the time period that we had. Um, I think a bigger point on that, um, we were not just looking at synergies water use. Um, the model that we developed, the regional model um, of this, this area of Upper Big Blue, has all of the water uses, all of the significant water uses incorporated into that model. Um, we have to do that um, in addition to incorporating estimates of local natural recharge um, to, to uh, get the model to simulate the, the, the water level increases and water level decreases that are, are, have been experienced um, over time. So um, I hope that clarifies that. It, it, it's just, it's just a, a, a data availability issue that really wouldn't have changed the output of our study at all. And what made your study only go three miles out? So the, the model actually, um, we actually simulated an area, give me one second, uh, it's kind of hard to see. Um, we simulated a, an area, a very large area around this plant. Um, there might be one that shows the three mile buffer, no. But yeah, we, we, went, we went quite a bit farther than three miles out. Um, uh, the reason that we stopped at three miles for looking at individual wells um, is the regulation. Um, they require us to, to look specifically at in the, all, every individual well within that three mile radius. Um, you know, at, at about three miles, the drawdowns are um, in the range of one to three feet. Anywhere further away than three miles, the impacts are going to be less. Um, I kind of just have a little bit of a comment. I don't need anybody to answer a question for me. Um, I'm a little bit familiar with the wastewater treatment plant in Aurora. I do know, uh, first off, we have all this information, and it's great. I think it's well put together. But the, way, the wastewater just keeps getting me because we've been close to denying a lot of uh, things around here for a lot less. Uh, problems. So I know that the wastewater treatment in Aurora um, does have a computer uh, layout system that tells them exactly how much is going through the facility, how much uh, is you know close to being too much or how little it is. Um, I'm surprised that we don't have city administrator numbers that can give us that information. Um, I think that's really easy for them to provide for us. So I'm actually very surprised that Aurora was not able to give those numbers to us for this um, situation. Water is obviously a big deal. Um, I think it's really sensitive, but I think that the treatment for me is, is one of the biggest things that we have this huge layout here. And then basically the water treatment section is just saying we'll get to that when we need to. And I don't think that's quite enough information, especially when Aurora has put in this advanced system that can give us the information right now. We could go out there right now, they could tell us exactly how much wastewater is going through that plant, um, the numbers, the percentages, they could, I'm pretty sure they can go back however long we need to, that data is recorded for the city. Um, it's a very sophisticated system is what I'm saying. So. <laughs> I'm just very surprised that we don't have the information. 
Um, I believe it's very important information that was overlooked on this whole project. And um, I think we kind of got the answers from everybody else's question. So you're quite right. The Aurora Water Facility do know what they can and cannot do. Right? What I said was we had met with them and they had already confirmed to us that with their existing facilities, they could handle all of the wastewater if we were to um, send it their way. And the, the reaction to us when we initially met was that that would be, would be very welcome by them. Right? Partly because it also gives them the opportunity to do all of these system upgrades and um, uh, rerouting of sewers, etc. But I, I just want to make sure that you understand that Aurora have already told us that with the existing capacity, they can handle anything that we pay to them. Right? We are you know, still waiting to hear back from Aurora following our last meeting on several questions that we have posed to them in terms of capacity and water treatment, etc. So you know, we're waiting to hear back before we can make the next no, I totally, I totally understand, and I'm not saying that you're trying to hide anything or anything like that. I'm just um, knowing how Aurora City Council and the City Administrator and the office work there. Mm -hmm. Think that that information could have been provided in a, a data or numerical setting. I'm not saying you're lying at all. Totally believe you, um, but I just I think we need that hard data for me personally, I guess, um, to know exactly where we stand. question and then I'm done. Um, does the project's completion or viability depend depend on state or federal funding to be finished? Um, in regards to the the roads, I believe that I read that you're going to do a traffic study by chance, and then you're going to put in turning lanes and such like the, such as that. On Highway 34, I know that is a busy road that, as it is already. You've got Ions down the road. You've got CF Industries. You got everything there. Who's going to be responsible for paying for that as well? Um. So we will work together with um, the Nebraska Department of Transportation, Hamilton County Transportation Authority, et cetera, to agree what is the, uh, the right traffic management practice. Um, we are prepared to pay for the upgrades to the county roads, et cetera. We're trying to keep um, all of the turnoffs of Highway 34 into the plant to be an absolute minimum. And this is, we've already had a discussion together with the uh, Planning and Zoning Committee and the plan that you put up earlier, we've already adjusted based on their inputs, right? But I think everybody, if they have a chance to look at that plan, um, we're talking about turning off Highway 34 onto County Road L. It's really a very short distance. It's not on the board now, right? But it, it's really a very short distance. Um, we're talking about traveling on on that county road. They didn't actually point that out. I think I must be pointed out if you would like to. So, it's not showing on that particular right. right. Highway 34. There are two entrances into the plant. One is here, one is here. 
This entrance will go on to 34. But the main route for um, product traffic, if you like, is up here just off County Road. And so trucks will come in here through the loading bay circle and go out this way again. So we're really only talking about a very small um, length of the county road that is impacted. And if everybody could also try and remember that, the vast majority, and by that I mean 90% of our reduction will go by, will exit from the pipeline under the road into the new style pipeline. So it's only two months of the year that we expect to have truck traffic. And that will be a, approximately 96, 100 trucks a month in the spring. One month in the spring, one month in the fall. Four trucks a day. It's really very minimal. Okay, I have two other questions. In regards to the lighting, um, is the exterior lighting going to downcast with the old paper translucent shielding so there's not a glare? Can you repeat that, please? On the exterior lighting, downcast with old paper translucent shielding so there won't be no glare. Is that going to be put in, or what kind of lighting is going to be put in around there? Conditional uses you put on us or regulations. Okay. And then just say, happen to say 20 years from now that the plant is no longer using. I mean, it's shut down completely. Yeah. What happens with everything that's there? Is it just going to sit on that 168, 60 acres as an eyesore, or do they take care of it? Do you know? Um, David, do you know how to answer that? I mean, I think it's part of the conditional use plan requirements as to be commissioning, right? what the county requires. But if you don't, we don't just walk away and leave a rusting hole. That's what you mean, right? Yeah, we've heard that. Any yeah. <coughs> other questions from the planning commission? Well, okay, it's a little bit taking off of what she said, but what was the plan after the fourth generation? If we, keep, if we can keep going, why wouldn't we? So, you know, we're just going to go as long as we possibly can. You know, if there is a lifetime for this plant, things eventually wear out. There's a design life that we have at this plant, um, you know, which we see, we prepare and maintenance, etc., will keep us going for at least you know, 50, 60 years. But hopefully, we'll just continue on beyond that if we can. And who knows? Perhaps we all love the same enough, and you know, water and everything around it. You know, we just, we just keep going, right? We can expand. The question I ask is if it all goes into the pipeline, how does it benefit the community? So my question comes down uh, to a couple of comments that were made earlier. So in regards to the three possible, we're talking wastewater here, obviously. Um, so the three possible ways to mitigate your, your waste, two of the options, one of them being, uh, you mentioned the, the runoff will be clean enough for your, your uh, uh, your waste will be clean enough to, to use as runoff, but the next option was to re-inject the water. And forgive me, I'm not, I'm not super keen on the uh, the process, but if it's if it's not good enough to be re-injected into the water, is that, the, is that your waste is not good enough to be re-injected, or is it the process of re-injecting that's that that would cause the environmental impact? Can you clarify? Yes, thank you for, for asking. So, um, we may be getting caught a little bit in semantics here. So, um, there's three ways of disposing of wastewater. One is it goes to the city, as we discussed. The other one is the runoff. Or the third one is 
injecting it into the ground back into the aquifer, right? But I think your question where is it injecting was us actually, instead of us having water run off and go to drain at all, is why can we not just continuously loop it around, right? My concern is that there was a comment made that injecting it back into the aquifer has negative impacts, but runoff is clean enough to go into the runoff. No, no, I don't, that's not, that's, if I gave that impression, I apologize, that's not what I was saying. What I said is, is it, it's clean enough to run off. It's also clean enough to put into the ground. But I'm saying it's not, it's, it's not as simple just putting it in the ground as you would think, right? You still need to have pumping in there, you still need to have certain conditions met, it's still an engineering process that has to be gone through to be evaluated whether it's sensible or viable. So, you know, we compare that to the other options as well. But, it, but, but the water is clean enough to go back in the ground. It's really very clean. Okay, that was the, that was the point of clarification, thanks. Thank you. Would you drink it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would. Uh, the other question, uh, it probably has nothing to pertain to this. What is the subsidy that the federal government is putting to? Uh, I understand it's three times. It's not economically the way it is without the federal government in this. So there are, um, there are very many federal subsidies. Um, available. Um, one federal subsidy is uh, on hydrogen, but that federal subsidy is tied to the hydrogen being green. And you know, hydrogen becomes green if it is made with renewable energy that makes certain conditions. Right? Our plan is to buy um, uh, our power through MPPD and SPPD, as I've mentioned. So we're buying it you know, and we're paying the state for that. And at the present time, um, NPPD, which is part of Southwest Power Pool, is 65% nuclear, which is clean, but it's not green. It doesn't qualify. So there is some green energy available, but it's probably spoken for, and it also comes at a premium. And so you know, if we were to buy that, it would increase our costs. And, if, and you know, we have to have that green energy then to qualify for the subsidy. Will we take advantage of that subsidy? The answer is, is if we can, absolutely. But we can't just you know, turn up here because, and do what we like because there isn't the amount of green energy um, available tomorrow for us to be able to get hold of that subsidy. So it's not anything that we can you know, take to the bank. <coughs> Right. We would certainly, if we could get it, we would certainly take it. I'm sure any of us would do that. Okay, are there any other questions? We don't get to. Oh, we don't get to? Sorry. <coughs> Just clarification. It said in your information, no wind or solar energy at this time. <coughs> well, if we approve this conditional use, how will we know if that will come at a later time? So, any additional use like that, a wind farm, a solar farm, at this site or anywhere in Hamilton County, would require the developer of that, whether it's Synergen or anybody else, to go through a process just like this. And the county, just like it does with this use, would have discretion to approve or deny or condition that use. That would be subject to public notice, public hearings, applications, everything that this is subject to. So um, uh, you, you would have lots of uh, knowledge of it and lots of opportunity for input as the planning commission, as the county, et cetera. Mr. Levy, do you want to do any rebuttal? Thank you for the opportunity. Um, you know, I think I appreciate all the questions from the commission because that tells us 
what your questions are and, and what you're thinking about and what we may not have uh, addressed so far. Um, I think, you know, John and Jim have done a great job of answering the questions. Um, I don't know that we need to belabor it. The, the one thing I would add that hasn't been said yet is that as is stated in our application, the evidence in the record before you, the application, the testimony, all the other information that you have, what you have tonight, demonstrates that this land use, and this is really the question with all respect before this commission as a legal matter, the questions before this commission are, does this proposed use, is it consistent with the Hamilton County Comprehensive Plan? The information shows that it is. And does it meet the requirements of the Hamilton County zoning regulations? And again, the evidence shows that it does. I think uh, John Shepard <coughs> from Marvin Planning Consultants may have some additional remarks to that effect. I know they've studied it. They may have findings of fact and conditions of approval and conditions of, appro of approval are certainly within this body's purview as again as a legal matter and with all respect that's why it's called a conditional use because a conditional use depends on the circumstances and uh, it may require certain conditions of approval that respond to those circumstances and so we, we fully understand and anticipate that we look forward to working with the county to satisfy any condition of approval should this be approved but again i want to be very clear the question before you again with all respect but as a legal matter is a very narrow question and that question or those questions are does this comply with is it consistent with your comprehensive plan and does it meet the requirements of your zoning regulations if the answer to those two questions is yes based on evidence in the record not based on opinion based on evidence in the record then as a legal matter, you should vote to recommend approval of this to the county board. And we, again, appreciate your time. We really do appreciate all the questions. And I would respectfully ask that you do vote to recommend this uh, to the county board. We understand there's time between now and then. We've been taking notes of the questions and, and things that you feel are unanswered. I'm sure that the minutes of this would go to the county board. And we would work between now and then diligently to answer as many of those questions as we could before that time. So thank you, and again, we'd appreciate your vote uh, to recommend approval of this to the county board. Thank you. Um, thank you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand here. <clears throat> We've all been sitting for a while. <clears throat> but again, my name is John Shepard. I'm a senior planner with Marvin Planning Consultants. That my boss, Keith Marvin, worked with Hamilton County on drafting your comprehensive plan and drafting your zoning regulations. And those have, have changed in realm and context and every day we learn a new thing. And this, this time we're learning about, about green hydrogen as it is. Uh, members of the Planning Commission should have received a report I gave to Hillary Becca on March 4th that, that we were engaged to, to review the project look at, at some of the, the context behind it, and then do an analysis of elements of the comprehensive plan and the zoning regulations that apply to this case. That this is a project that's both very exciting, this is really cutting edge um, things, that there are the new hydrogen hubs <coughs> in other states. And on the other hand, it's ammonia. Hamilton County farmers know about ammonia. You also know about renewable energy, ethanol, biodiesel is not too far away. In my report, I mentioned ammonia is not a biofuel, but there are people who are going to make it a biofuel. Um, whether that fits in the context of this specific question, um, Mr. Levy's questions, those are your two most important questions. However, to put that in context, a conditional use is a use that may be conditions to mitigate its impacts on the communities and specifically on the neighbors. So within that, I talked about many of the, the exciting positive things with economic development and energy and natural resources, and also some of the concerns that were brought up this evening with prime farmland and the water use. In your zoning regulations there, I found 158 different references to the word water. Yet, 
under the Nebraska, the Nebraska regulatory system, you have a cooperative relationship with the NRD, and it's their purview to issue the permit. You can express your concerns. You may have um, concerns that could be expressed in conditions. Um, but really, the, in your zoning regulation, you don't have requirements for water permits. You do have requirements for wastewater treatment. And that may be a situation where this application may have, may have been a bit early, but you have the opportunity to condition your concerns with wastewater. Um, I brought up a number of, of zoning issues in review, which were in your packet, that I'll jump straight forward to you know, the conditional use criteria, which are on your findings, that, that we made recommendations in that these are based on our best reading of what's in your comp plan, your zoning, what are best practices on similar facilities. Not that there are a lot of similar facilities out there right now, but based on your practical experience, both with um, cooperative um, uh, fertilizer plants uh, and with renewable energy facilities. <coughs> that, uh, the, the 12 recommendations are on there. The first recommendation is that, in our opinion, the proposed development meets the definition of an agricultural cooperative production distribution facility, which Hillary brought up at the very, very beginning of their hearing a couple hours ago. That, that we had a, a recommendation that if you are concerned about the specific zoning district, that you may want to recommend concurrent amendment of the land use plan to a flex zone. Um, but the fact is, this is a listed use in the transitional agricultural zone. This is simply uh, something you could consider if you wanted to, if you're concerned about the base zoning. But frankly, we wouldn't treat it any differently than flex zoning and the TA zone. It, and we have flex zoning right across the street with the existing facilities. Uh, Hillary, can you help me out here? Yeah, and I was in those other ones up there. Plus the fact that you're within less than a, a mile of an international ammonia pipeline it goes all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. The third recommendation, <coughs> excuse me, dealt with the, the road situation. And, and I want to acknowledge that the applicants did redesign the site from the initial application to meet concerns with road and with, with industrial buffers. It, it, my suggested condition, dedicate design and construct South L Road as the primary site access um, as provided in Section 823 of the zoning regulations. Basically, I suggest you let the county highway superintendent set those requirements. Um, that's his job. That uh, number four, align the proposed access on Highway 34 with the existing access point north of the right of way. Hopefully, Nebraska DOT would catch that, but sometimes they don't. Um, the uh, number five applicant should identify proposed construction hall route for the county highway superintendent's approval. We don't want all routes coming and, and digging up your, your gravel roads. Um, the uh, number uh, six applicant shall maintain conformance with the performance standards in section 817 of the zoning regulation of proper mitigation for fire hazards as may be required by the local fire chief. Um, I understand that applicants have been talking to the local fire department. Uh, again, your local, um, your local fire department, your county emergency manager, your regional emergency management has experience with ammonia, they have experience with hazardous materials, with, with um, potentially um, flammable materials. Um, but there was, a, there was a, it brought up that um, we, it may be in your interest to condition that um, in case people forget down the road. Uh, we also suggest that the, uh, that the applicant should offer have tour and training for not just the local fire department, but any of those who may respond by mutual aid. And I'm sure that's part of, the, part of your operations anyways. Um, the uh, number eight, applicants shall maintain conformance with standards in section 818, zoning reg regulations for above ground storage tanks. There are two storage tanks that look different than our usual ones, but that's again stating, and within the condition we're just stating, hey, let's make sure we remember. The other thing with the conditions that you recommend, hopefully in, in some day in the next five or 10 years, 
you will all have recruited your replacements on this board, but they won't necessarily remember what our discussion was here tonight. Conditions on the CUP will be preserved for future um, for, for future reference. So you all can remember what we talked about tonight. Uh, the number nine applicant shall provide proof of approval, appropriate federal uh, regulatory authority prior to connection facility to the ammonia pipeline. Uh, the county has no authority to regulate the interstate pipeline, but we can ask for documentation so that we know what's going on in our area. Um, but for the most part, we can't do much about pipelines. The uh, number 10, require exterior lighting to be downcast with opaque or translucent shielding so as not to cast glare off the site. That's just good business practice that that you don't want to waste light, but also that, that we don't want uh, security lights glaring out onto the U.S. highway. You'd think that people would know better, but I, I drive by places at night when I'm out for work, and the, the, the security lights are off the site, not on the site. Um, or maybe I'm just getting old. My classes don't work like they used to. The uh, um, number 11, require a detailed site plan with the zoning per, uh, permit prior to construction scale sufficient to confirm all structures and setbacks sealed by Nebraska Professional Engineer Registered Surveyor. This is a two-step process, and it's always a bit of, of how much detail do we want now versus what comes later. The applicant is only authorized for what is part of the record from this approval. If they decide to change their mind later, they have to come back and start. So they, they want to keep it, it's, it's understandable business practice. We don't want them to go to final engineering and they say, oh, we need to move something. But we just want to be very clear here, when they come to Hillary for, for their final site plan zoning permit, that it reflects what's in this and that also that a, a PE and Olson, whoever you use for your local work has to be registered in Nebraska. Um, and then a, a 12th recommendation, simply simply acknowledges any modification to site plan for the project must be approved by the zoning administrator. Things happen, things, things get shifted, but at a certain point, if it gets shifted enough, it's gonna be up to your zoning administrator if it has to come back uh, for your review. Um, I think that I may have and jumped over the one with the wastewater. Um, yeah, number seven, applicants shall submit wastewater treatment plans to the planning commission for approval prior to application. This is not a typical recommendation, but especially given the concerns that people have had, that frankly, the, the state of Nebraska, the EPA, are the ones that are gonna have their feet on wastewater, are gonna hold their feet to the fire on wastewater. But rather than um, a denial, you may want to say, hey, um, we're gonna give this a conditional, conditional use of approval, a conditional approval, but we wanna see more specifically what's gonna happen with that wastewater. This is not a typical recommendation. It, it's frankly, it's not, it's not a pref I'm sure it's not a preference for the applicant or for the planning commission, but it may be a way to deal with that issue without putting the entire project off track. Frankly, it'd be up to the county board to decide if they want to deal with it like that or not. So, um, Madam Chair, did, did you have any other questions? Um, I don't. Does anybody else have questions? Um, am I allowed to ask a question of the participants? Of what participants? Who are you referring to? Okay. Uh, well, I, 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 in a way, I don't appreciate that I wasn't recognized with my hand up. Yeah. So that process is done. Can we open? Can we reopen? Can we have a motion to reopen it? To open what? Um, the question time the, the question time is still there. <laughs> okay. It was so, over his, I, thought you, I thought you closed the question, so I'm sorry. No, it, it's fine. I have a question for Curtis Jump. Um, you have, Curtis, you, you expressed to us that you're the same power pool that we are. Is that correct? That is correct. And then and we have power pool is called, what's it called again? Southwest Power Pool, SPP. Okay. 
Can you can you elaborate on the lawful your experience with the large power users? Yes, um, I can share with you what has affected the entire SVP power pool and what we've experienced in North Dakota. So we ended up adding this data center, very large power user. Right now, 260 megawatts. It was done four years ago, roughly. Came online. They want to grow to 700 megawatts. That's not happening yet, but given their 260 megawatts into the pool, the rates for all of North Dakota customers have been increasing, and one of our largest utility companies called Montana Dakota Utilities of Energy Resources filed a complaint with the FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, because of the impact that that large user has had on the SPP pool and the wheeling of wholesale power. Wholesale power is their customers are suffering. This is all new stuff in the last month and a half or two. You can Google MDU's filing to FERC. I don't know how much power this facility is going to use because in the 56 pages I couldn't find it, but I did find that they said due to degradation of their um, process, their, their power use is going to go up 23.5 megawatts a year. In 10 years, that's 23, or it's going to go up 2.3, I'm sorry, 2.35. In 10 years, that's 23.5 megawatts, and then they do a refurbing, whatever, and it goes back down. But this hydrogen doesn't look like it's going to be green. And it's not going to be uh, your power, um, Nebraska Power, allocating green just to this facility, like what was told to the public that the Super Bowl ran all on green power. Now, isn't that something? Nevada Power, which is primarily coal power, they didn't just say, okay, for the Super Bowl, we're going to take all that green power. By the way, when that green power, a chunk of its wind, the wind wasn't blown, the sun wasn't going either during the Super Bowl. So that's sort of a, the, the kind of thing that happens. You know, um, figures don't lie, but liars sure figure. Petroleum engineer out of college I worked for, that was the first thing he taught me. So I'm just telling you that this isn't looked to be green hydrogen. They're going to be taking power off the SPP pool, which is who serves your Nebraska power. So what's happened in North Dakota? We have significant reliability issues. We had my neighbor put in an $8,000 backup generator running on natural gas. We're trying to decide whether to do ours home. Reliability is one thing, but you know what's happened? In 18 years of owning this home in rural Burley County, I've had minimal increases. All of a sudden, May of 2023, a grid capacity charge, all due to this SPP stuff. 15% increase in rates. Guess what's coming May of 24? Sent right in the letter, 8% increase. So I'm, if this is my world of energy and natural gas. I email the rural electric co-op. How long is this gonna continue and what are you doing? Well, we're told by our wholesale power, wholesale power suppliers, which is SPP and MISO, you can expect another two years at least of increases. So I'm already at 23% to our house. By two, two more years from now, it'll be 50%. So Basin Electric Power Cooperative serves all the RECs. They're building a $1 billion natural gas fire generation facility at Williston, which will send power to the SPP. Uh, it's on the list to find out if us rural electric people are going to be picking up that cost. You know why they're building a billion dollar natural gas fire generation facility? Because a cryptic mining data center wants to go to 700 megawatts. And our rates are going like this. I'm telling you all, water is huge, but this thing, this facility gets online, and then all of a sudden, uh, yep, no problem, the water, this wastewater plant can handle all the wastewater. I heard somebody say, oh, we got 40 lots we're gonna develop. I'm oh, sorry, we're at capacity now, we have to expand the plant so everybody, all the residents of Aurora are gonna have to pay. Because they're existing, they were here first. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that goes on. We, as consumers, always end up paying. We end up with the crap falling down right here and out of state investors are coming in and we, we're we ending up paying. And guess what? Our property taxes are going up second year in a row. How does that work? I mean, uh, get ready, that's all I'm saying. Do you have any more questions, Greg?
So if you want to, if you want to do nothing and see your infrastructure deteriorate, then do nothing. But if you want to, if you want to progress, you have to go through the process of applying for a loan, and then you also have to go through all the studies to get your up for that Can we please keep the comments down? Okay, so then five minutes. So, yeah, really, right, five so, minutes? You know, it, it, again, I just wanted to say to Curtis, right, SPP had nothing to do with grounding the data center. Studies would have been done. You know, there will probably be an increase. In, you know, there could be a million reasons for that increase in rates. But the good news about Nebraska is because it's predominantly nuclear, it has very stable rates. If you go to other offshores, such as MISO, if you go down into Louisiana, uh, excuse me, Louisiana, which is natural gas, their rates go up and down like ping pong balls. And that's not because of MISO necessarily, it's the price of natural gas. And that's because there's a war going on and all the other things. But, you know, that happens across the nation. So, you know, please don't believe everything you hear. <laughs> You're back in your to make sure that you understand the real reasons. Adequate utilities, access roads, drainage, and necessary facilities have been or are being provided. have been or will be taken to provide ingress and egress so designated as minimized traffic congestion in the public streets. Okay, the use shall not include any activity involving the use or storage of flammable or explosive material unless protected by adequate firefighting suspension equipment and by such safety devices as are normal used in the hauling of any such material. Yes, it is. Very, very, very happy. But it's safety device stored across the It's no different from the city. It's still a heavily material. Right. Are there safety plans? No, please do not at this time. The use shall not include noise that is a public nuisance due to volume, frequency, or best or beat, and unless muffled or otherwise controlled. The use shall not include vibration, which is discernible without instruments on any adjoining lot or property. The use shall not involve any pollution of the air by fly ash, dust, vapors, or other substances which are harmful to health, animals, vegetation, or other property, or which can cause soil discomfort or irritation. Irritation comes from ammonia leaks. The use shall not involve any malodorous gas or matter that is discernible on any adjoining lot or property. The use shall not involve any direct or reflective glare that is visible from any adjoining property or from any public street, road, or highway. The use shall not involve any activity substantially increasing the movement of traffic on public streets unless procedures are instituted to limit traffic hazards and congestion. The use shall not involve any activity substantially increasing the burden on any public utilities or facilities unless provisions are made for any necessary adjustments. Thank you. 
Any other findings of fact arising from the public hearing? I just want to add really quickly before everybody starts to clear out. 
Um, this was a denial, so that will go to the Board of Commissioners as a recommendation for denial. So there will be another meeting, um, it'll be publicized. So, And I do not have anything to report. There being no further business, entertain a motion and second to adjourn the meeting. The time is 9.57. Could you please stack your chairs as you leave?